Cool. All right. We'll make a we'll make a start. Um, so, hello everyone. Welcome to DevOps Manchester 24. Uh, this is our latest online lockdown edition. We're very glad to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've got two great speakers. Um, but before I get started, um, I just want to make a quick reminder that this session is being recorded. Um, so if you don't want people seeing your face uh, when we share it, um, then stop your video now. Um, but other than that, um, obviously, this will be to, to capture the recordings and let people who aren't able to make it tonight uh, catch up on what should be two great talks. Um, so introducing that very briefly, uh, we've got Kuvi up first. He's a software craftsperson at Codurance. He's going to be talking about his DevOps story. So um, should be some great tips in there for, for getting started with DevOps and, and a few good uh, good tips on, on where to start, what to do, and, and hopefully some good resources that people can go away with as well. Um, secondly, we've got Andy uh, joining us from Sky Betting and Gaming. Uh, he's a platform engineer there. He's going to be talking about curating a platform experience, particularly excited to, to see this one um, because of some of my own recent experiences. So hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll be some great tips in there as well. I'll be looking forward to that too. Um, Q&A will be managed by myself. So I've not introduced myself yet. My name's John. Uh, I'm a, I, I head up data engineering and integration at AOM, part of the, the data leadership team here. Um, I'm particularly interested in how DevOps applies to data. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunity in that space. So if that's something you're interested in and fancy having a chat about, then uh, please do reach out. And I'd love to have that talk. Um, with that, I will pass over to Kumi, um, who can take away the, the first talk. Um, so if you've got any questions just before we do that, um, either raise your hand uh, or ask a question in the chat. Uh, but we'll be doing the questions at the end. So Kubi will do his talk and we'll pick up any questions uh, after that. So we'll make sure we've got a bit of time for that as well. Um, so yeah, over to you, Kubi. That's good, thank you. Um, I can't share my screen. Can you give me permission, please? I'll sort that out for you now, Kubi. Yes. Is it not letting you? Is it letting you share your screen now? Uh, let me try. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Well, there we go. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yep, yeah, coming through. Stuff. Uh, okay, I'll start. Oh, hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Kuvi. I work as a software craft person at Coturance. Uh, we are a consulting company. Um, I'm kind of easy to reach out on the internet. I've got a super long name, which is kind of unique. So if you Google me, you'll find me easily. If you've got any more questions after, after this talk. Um, uh, actually, an interesting fact, my previous job when I started, they couldn't create my account. My name was too long. Can you believe it? It's 2021 and it and we got a system that couldn't handle my name, but I was quite proud of that. But anyway, uh, yeah, today I want to talk up, talk about my DevOps story. Um, so I'm kind of new in this world. So I uh, just wanted to share a couple of resources, tips, co uh, courses, videos that helped me while I was learning about it and when I was doing the job. Um, so yeah, what, what is a DevOps engineer and what's the role of a DevOps engineer? Um, even I'm not too sure. Uh, the leaders, I guess, in this field um, will probably tell you there's no such thing as a DevOps engineer. Uh, DevOps is a culture and a role, uh, which they are technically correct. Uh, but as it so often happens, this term has kind of changed. And I mean, DevOps is generally a way to deliver software with you know shared understanding and responsibility, and you know breaking down the silos and making sure we delivering good, good software at a good pace. Uh, but I think from what I've seen from my experience as a DevOps engineer, you help build a digital pipeline, which takes code from the developer's laptop and push it to production and get the feedback from production and and push that back to developers who 
Uh, it's all about building those tools that help automate that journey. Um, so what do you actually need to do if you're trying to get into this kind of DevOps pollution and you're completely brand new, uh, just like me? Um, so a bit of more background about myself. So last eight, nine years, most of my career, I've been focusing on building uh, UI apps. So focusing on front end, uh, building mobile apps. By the way, I did not build this app. I should put a reference here, it's just a screenshot. Uh, but mostly, yeah, building UI, never done any backend or infrastructure kind of stuff. Um, and front end development is the tip of the iceberg. And behind the scene, there's servers, infrastructure, database, message view, a bunch of stuff uh, that makes your app useful. And yeah, I was always curious how they work and integrate, uh, but never got the chance to do it uh, for various reasons. Um, I mean, this is one of the reasons I, I left my previous job, specializing in front end to like a more uh, back end role, DevOps role, so I get to learn those, uh, those technologies. Uh, but when I started my new job, uh, there was a big gap to fill. Uh, I said I didn't know much about it, so uh, that was a bit challenging. Um, so being a developer, when we don't know about something, usually the trick is we Google it. Uh, when we can't fix something, we need to find a solution. So I Google it. What does it take to be a DevOps engineer? What 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 stuff do I need to learn? And I came across this website, roadmap.sh, which is quite good, actually. It gives you kind of a high-level bird's eye view of different concepts you need to know and a bit of more detail about each concept, what you need to learn. But it's quite quite big, there's lots of stuff. Uh, I could not even fit the whole roadmap in this slide, uh, which was interesting. Um, so I kept Googling and I came across this cloud native landscape picture as well. So as a DevOps engineer, you're quite likely to do stuff on cloud. And this is a bunch of tools that probably need to know, not all of them, but uh, some of them might be useful uh, in this role. And it's quite scary, <laughs> there's lots of stuff out here. And, how do you start? What do you need to learn? I mean, crazy to learn all this stuff. It's impossible, really. Uh, so it's kind of very overwhelming. Uh, from what I've seen, you need lots of skills. You need to be a good system administrator. You need to know about virtualization. You need to know about storage, networking, security, a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. Uh, so yeah, it's an intimidating list. I mean, what I'm trying to drive home here is this is not just beginner job role. Uh, but however, it's worth the pursuit because I personally think you grow quite a bit and you learn lots of stuff if you're curious like me. Uh, so as a developer, when you face with a big problem, again, what do we usually do? We try to split it up into smaller programs, like focus on fundamentals first and then build on top of that. So I decided to break down my study path into uh, fun foundational knowledge. So I broke down my my studies and first get to know Linux better. Uh, second, learn about a cloud provider. And thirdly, uh, we could, if you know programming, but I already knew programming uh, from my previous experience. So I decided to learn about containers and orchestration. Um, so that was my plan. Uh, so yeah, Linux, basically that's where everything runs. So Therefore, it's quite important, I think, as a DevOps engineer to learn about Linux. Uh, and honestly, the best way to do it is to just install Linux on your machine or just boot uh, a server on AWS for free and mess around, break stuff. Uh, you will get stuck. You will have to fix stuff. Uh, it's all good fun. As my previous DevOps mentor told me, the best way to learn about new technology is to use it in anger. Uh, he set yourself a deadline, a small project, try to do it and put those constraints in and you will you you have to learn stuff and figure out stuff. Um, but uh, those two books kind of helped me. I mean, as a front-end dev, I didn't have to do much with Linux and administrating Linux servers. And so uh, also didn't do much bash. So the Linux command line book by William Schultz, I thought it was quite beginner friendly and it helped me understand lots of concept on, on bash. And uh, and the Linux administration handbook also was quite beginner friendly to get going with Linux, learn all the concept and fundamentals of Linux. And learning 
it's quite important because I know everything is abstracted away from us, uh, but when stuff breaks, it's yeah, yeah you at some point it will quite likely happen. You have to go down the Linux stack and see what's going on and try to debug. So uh, I think it's quite important to learn that. And secondly, uh, uh, if you haven't done much on the cloud like me, uh, learning about the cloud is, is kind of important and uh, uh, it's kind of expected you, you're gonna need to know about public cloud and AWS is a dominant player in this space with uh, offering the richest set of tools to work with. And to do this, what I, I did, I went for a couple of certification on AWS uh, and uh, to help me study for those certifications, I use a cloud guru uh, and it's quite a good website. It's very beginner friendly. They explain stuff very well. They have hands on lab where you can try out different stuff. And, and it also doesn't hurt to be certified in the world leading cloud provider. I mean, it's, it's, it, it will touch only a subsection of what you need to know as DevOps, but you get a, a good type of thinking about stuff you need to know as DevOps engineer, like stateless architecture or to scaling serverless, uh, you'll get kind of a bird's eye view of, of stuff you need to know. And yeah, I decided to pick one of the path on uh, AWS certification. So uh, if you're completely new, start with cloud practitioner, gives you a good foundation uh, and then choose one of those path. Uh, there's an obvious one here, DevOps engineer. And it, will, it takes quite a bit of time. Uh, it's probably gonna take you two, three months to depending how much time you're gonna spend on your study and learning and practicing to get a couple of those certification. There's loads there, but I guess just focusing on one path to get going would be good. And and it's all, it's very easy to create an account. It's free to try out stuff and doing free labs. So yeah, I mean, the good thing with certification, I think it gave me a bit of focus instead of, because there's so much thing you need to learn. It gives you a, a focus to study uh, for that exam and learn some specific concept instead of going you know, down rabbit holes and then getting lost and you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so yeah. And certainly uh, uh, learning about containers and if you're gonna build big scale application, uh, you're gonna need to orchestrate those containers. That's where Docker and Kubernetes are kind of the leading uh, tools for those. Uh, so, I had to learn that. And one of my uh, previous colleagues who is a, a DevOps engineer, he recommended uh, having a look at DevOps Kata's hand hand, hands-on book. So Kata is basically a small exercise that you could use daily or every week. It's not a big project and it allows you to practice your skills on, for example, containers. There's a bunch of exercises you do there. There's also stuff about continuous integration, which you could it's good to know as well. Uh, but yeah, you can try out those katas on your own time and they are small and you get a bit of practice. Uh, so the resource that kind of helped me is uh, this website called O'Reilly Katakoda, which is has a set of, again, small hands-on exercises that you could do and they are free and you could do them in the browser so you don't have to install anything uh, locally. Uh, so it's kind of win-win. You you pick up like Kubernetes and start playing around with it in the browser and, and learning about it uh, a bit more. Uh, so yeah, have a look at that. And thirdly, I learn a lot with watching uh, uh, videos from Tech World with Nana. She got a content of very beginner friendly, uh, and um, I learn a lot about. Especially Kubernetes was kind of a steep learning curve. I still don't really know it that much there's so much to learn about it but uh as a beginner she has some good content and she's she just started this devops boot camp um which uh looks decent uh i haven't been on that boot camp but yeah it looks decent and worth having a look um and uh yeah the other thing as a devops engineer you uh, you probably gonna write some infrastructure as good and and uh and it's a key DevOps practice. It's used in conjunction with continuous delivery. Uh, infrastructure as code is basically, instead of you manually creating the infrastructure, you write it in code and and and, and keep that in under source control. Um, so yeah, and to learn that, um, the Terraform up and running book from Yevgeniev, 
that's pretty good. I recommend have a look at that. And the Terraform official website uh, is pretty good as well. It's quite beginner friendly. It has, uh, as I explained, stuff. They have like hands-on exercises you, you do as you go along. And again, here you can use the same concept of a kata where you set up a small exercise. For example, you want to deploy your CV as a web page on AWS. It sounds easy, simple. Uh, but let's say you're not using serverless. You you have to create a virtual machine. You have to create some kind of networking. You have to create a web server. You have you need to provision your uh, a storage. So just this little exercise, you get to try out it, uh, lots of stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's worth having a look. Um, and also wanted to uh, talk about yeah, that was about learning and also about my experience as a software developer. Uh, coming into this DevOps kind of role, how I found it. Um, um, so one of the first things which uh, struck me was I found this feedback loop pretty slow compared to normal application development where uh, the usual way of doing application using TDD, you write your test, you will get it to pass. The, the feedback cycle if, to see if something is working was kind of within milliseconds or re really quick. Uh, but with Terraform or infrastructure code to try it out, uh, uh, it it takes longer and uh, you need a bit of patience with it. And uh, and for example, on the, my previous project, uh, we had some Terraform code which was creating an infrastructure in Azure. It was quite complicated. Maybe that was the issue. It was complicated, but it would take like 30 minutes to create a Kubernetes cluster with I think Rancher and uh, creating all those servers. And that's quite a long time to wait for. Like if you try something, wait 30 minutes to see if it's working. Let's say you start them from, starting from scratch. I mean, yeah, uh, that was not uh, fun, but the only good thing was I would let it create the infrastructure. I would go for a run and come back. So I was getting healthier. Uh, but I guess it's an extreme case. It doesn't need to be like that. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, as other thing, when we were looking at uh, some Kubernetes open source project. It was lots of YAML. There's lots of YAML everywhere. And those YAML files, some of them were super long and like 2000 lines of code in one file. I'm like, wow, what is this? I mean, you, you I'm not saying you won't see it in application code. Uh, you, you might see it in some project, depending on how people have written it. Uh, but yeah, that was interesting. And the other thing, uh, uh, we didn't have automated tests, so we don't know if our infrastructure is good. Is it working? The only way to see if it's working, you have to log in to AWS. Is there a server there? Can it, does it work? So that feedback loop was kind of er slow and error prone. So uh, yeah, that was a bit of a shock, but then we started having a look like, surely there must be better ways of doing this. So I came across this website called Do Better As Good, and it had a, they have a talk actually uh, about best practices to write infrastructure as good. Um, uh, there's a whole talk about it, but they, they have this website as well where it gives you a bunch of tools that you can use to write tests for your uh, infrastructure as good. It has tools to link your code so to make sure you're building you know, higher quality code. It's picking up error really quickly instead of you, you know, waiting for everything to deploy and manually try out stuff. So. Yeah, definitely have a look at that. Uh, basically, you would, for example, you would, there's a tool called TerraTest, which will allow you to write tests for your Terraform module. So you, one module could be like a module to create a web server. And the test would be once that's done, go, I don't know, ping it. If you, I get uh, 200 back, it's all good. So it's all working. We haven't broken anything and it's, it's automated. And uh, the same practices, I guess, as a software develop, when you're doing software development, apply here as well. Like keep your code clean, use good naming, keep it small as files, try to break it down. Don't create 2000 lines of file because it's hard to maintain and read, make it readable. And yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're learning, I mean, a couple of tips about learning in general. I mean, it might be obvious, but if you look at this pyramid, uh, if your strategy of learning is just watching lectures, reading, and kind of being in this passive mode, you probably won't retain that much and you will slowly lose that knowledge. So I, 
I, I recommend going down this pyramid where it says, you know, go towards like more collaborative way of learning, having discussion, demonstration, teaching others is the best way to learn. So for example, what you could do in your company, you could set up a community of practice where a couple of you are interested in learning a couple of those uh, DevOps concepts or play with infrastructure as good. You could bounce out ideas, discuss your approach and, uh, and learn from that. Um, yeah, and yeah, practice, practice is the best way to learn. Uh, yeah, that's all my uh, findings so far. Uh, when I've been working as a DevOps engineer, I'm relatively new, so, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I have covered lots of stuff, uh, like observability, monitoring, logging, there's a bunch of stuff as well there you need to, it's good to know. And it's a very young discipline, I believe. Uh, there's lots of tools and practices coming out. This, and so it's good to keep exploring out there what's going on and see what new practices are coming out and, and, and help you make a good, you know, educated opinion on their strengths and weaknesses. Um, yeah, that's kind of it really. Uh, um, well, best of luck if you're starting from, you, you started learning in this field and I remember it take 10,000 hours to become expert in something. So yeah, the more time you put now, the easier uh, it will get. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kubi. It's a bit difficult right. virtually, but imagine a full room of clapping people right now. Thank <laughs> you very much. Right. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. We've had a couple come through uh, on the chat already. Um, if anyone else does have a question, just use the raise hand feature um, and then we'll pick, pick out your question if you do have it. You've got the opportunity to, to speak uh, directly. James uh, will be able to unmute you for that. Um, but to kick off, um, I'll ask a couple of the ones that we've had through, Kirby, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Perfect. Yeah, good. Uh, so we have one um, on on your DevOps journey. Do you have any uh, particular stories of how your DevOps mentor helped you? Um, like, what were the characteristics that person had? How did they encourage you on your journey? And and uh, how how was that to have someone who could help you in that kind of role? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely helped me a lot. I mean, some of those resources out there were suggested by my mentor. So. So uh, having that is great. Otherwise, just like I said, if you Google it out there, it's like there's so many stuff to learn. Where do you start? How do you get going? So yeah, yeah definitely. And uh, pairing with them, so you get that feedback and being on a real project to to try it out and, and, and learn from that. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, from my own journey learning new things, sometimes, especially in tech, there are just so many different avenues you can go down. Um, yeah. And before you know it, you've not really learned anything. You've just got a lot of words in your head that don't really mean that much. So having some exactly. guide that is definitely useful, I think. I think those katas help where you have a small project you do because if you just learn stuff, watching videos and but don't do anything, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, we had another question. Um, how could someone who's already in a DevOps role encourage or support more people with that career path? Uh, yeah, I guess giving talks like that and then and, and putting it uh, online. So like some people try to write this DevOps training plan. As I said, uh, this website, someone put in an effort to kind of say, look, you, you need to know all those stuff. So yeah, sharing with the community, I guess, is a good way. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we have a hand up, Lee Jarvis. James, do you want to bring him through? Hello. Yeah, yeah, I posted it in the chat as well. And I was just wondering, you know, you posted all these resources and they look amazing. But was there any moment in sort of going through those where you had this kind of light bulb moment where everything sort of made sense and, you know, the, the forces aligned, so to speak? And, and what did trigger that, if so? Uh, I think watching uh, Tech World with Nana kind of makes sense. It was very big enough from the way she was explaining those concepts. It was, uh, the, I think, she helped me quite a lot watching her video. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, definitely. And doing those katas and doing those exercises, you get more confidence and you start tackling more complex projects and keep building your confidence. But yeah, there's still lots to learn there, I think. And accepting that you won't know everything, I think, is fine as well. 
Yeah, yeah, good tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Perfect. Thank you, Lee. Um, I can't see any other questions coming through. So um, with that, Kuvi, thank you very much for coming along, no uh, sharing all of these amazing tips with us today. I think it's um it is a testament to like, pick up something so new with DevOps in particular. I think that there is like tons to, to take through. And I think a lot of these resources you've shared uh, should help a lot of people. So really appreciate you coming along, sharing your experiences. And, and we hope to see you again in the future when you can share what you've learned of next course. with us as well. Yeah, yeah, no Perfect. problem. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, with that, then on to our second speaker. So Andy, platform engineer at Sky Betting and Gaming. Uh, he will be talking on curating a platform experience. So I'm going to hand you straight over to him. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, folks. The thing with learning, Kuvi, is it never stops. There's no end, unfortunately. Um, there, there is no done state with learning DevOps. Okay. Excuse me a moment while I do that thing where I stare blankly into the middle distance while I sort out all my windows and stuff. Uh, hopefully, you should be seeing uh, a lovely picture of Jeff Stelling. Please let me know if that's not the case. Yeah, coming through, Andy. Lovely. Okay. Hopefully, now that's changed to a slide deck, which means everything's working, which is even better. Right. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, I shall just click that and we're, we're off. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be about 40 minutes. Hope that's okay with everyone. Um, thanks for uh, coming along to the stream tonight, or if you're watching this on re recording, and thanks for taking the time to watch it. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about curating a platform experience. Uh, my name is Andy, and as the, I've been introduced, I am a, a lead platform engineer in the infrastructure platform in Infrastructure Platform Engineering Squad inside the Infrastructure and Platform Stripe at Sky Betting and Gaming. Um, we, amongst other things, offer hosting and infrastructure to many of the other tribes, which you can see on your screen here, and the squads within them for them to build out their uh, betting and gaming products for our uh, end users to use. So I'm going to start this talk a long time ago. Well, 2016. It's a long time ago in uh, Kubernetes land anyway. Um, but this document here, is um, was drafted in the Bet Tribe. They were looking to create a hosting platform for their future. And as you can see from the vision statement here, it says, outside of the squad, there should be no humans involved in the value stream between feature and customer. So this is this idea of going from idea to in front of a customer. I had to ching time to value, TTV is sometimes known as. Um, and this, over a period of time, uh, transpired to be the what became the Kubernetes platform for the Bet Tribe, which then became the Kubernetes Tribe for the rest of the business. Um, so if we fast forward to 2018, the Kubernetes platform is now run by IPE, Infrastructure Platform Engineering. Um, and I think it's fair to say that things are going pretty well. We've got loads of teams using our stuff, loads of squads, seems to be new teams joining every day. Um, but we were really accelerating growth on the platform. And with that, behind the scenes, there became a few growing pains, should we say. Um, we had a flat structure, ownership and responsibility, perhaps a little bit blurred. Our processes and ways of working weren't really scaling with our growth. Um, and it was causing some stresses, so something had to change. So the squad was broken into three different areas of focus. Sort of three teams, but without being put too much in a box. So we had our engine team, which looked after the core Kubernetes platform. We had our capabilities team, which looked after building infrastructure automation on top of the platform. So things like load balancers, firewalls, DNS, certificate management, all through uh, code. So implementing those. And then we had the newly formed customer experience team. So although uh, the people in these teams were given... Um, a responsibility and area of focus. It didn't mean that we just had to work on that stuff. We could work on features and tickets from the other teams if we wanted. Um, and that was a really good idea because um, there was a lot of uh, cross uh, team support needed with sort of day-to-day -day, uh, support rotors and things like that. So we weren't put into, uh, into uh, tight groups. 
So I got invited to head up the customer experience team, which I'm uh, dead excited about. Obviously, I have a chat with the boss, and my, my first question is, what do you want me to do, and how do you want me to do it? Uh, I'm given a big list of requirements, which my boss thinks might be things which will help, you know, put those in the in the list. We can, we can talk about them. But I said, that, that that's great, but that's not telling me how I'm going to do this. And he went, well, I don't know how you're going to do that. That's your job to work out. So that's okay. I've got um, most of the answer and most of the question. Uh, I have to go and work out everything else. Um, so let me introduce to you my team who's going to work with me um, in the customer experience. First of all, we've got Lydia. She's a brand new graduate, straight out of college through the uh, grad scheme. Um, super clever, super intelligent, fast learner. Great to have on the team. Howard uh, has been with the company for a couple of years. He uh, was also on the grad scheme, but he's worked in IPE for a couple of years now and is very knowledgeable about the Kubernetes platform we've got and all the connected things to it, which is great to have on board. Uh, and then there's, uh, the, their first question is, how are we going to do this then, Andy? What's the first thing we're going to do? Um, and I said, I don't know. We've got to work that out between us. So that was the first thing to do. So um, I've got a little bit more experience than a couple of years out as a graduate. Um, I've spent the last seven-ish years at Sky Betting Gaming working in Data Tribe and Bet Tribe and in IPE for a couple of years. And previous to that, I spent a long part of my career working in digital marketing. So building what we called CD-ROMs back in the day, uh, moving on to websites and uh, apps and hosting and sysadmin and eventually DevOps. But while I've been doing that, I was doing a lot of customer liaison and pitching for work and supporting for work and a lot of exposure to the business as well as I was doing that. So um, a lot of experience that I thought would be useful for this customer experience role. Let's find out. So armed with that and a pre-release copy of Team Topologies, um, the book of choice uh, for uh, people trying to work out how teams should be structured. Um, I set off into the unknown to work out how we were going to do this stuff. So what do we do first? If we're thinking in our DevOps mindset, the first thing we do is measure. Let's get a baseline. Let's understand the state of things. Let's understand uh, how our customers are using our stuff and also their opinions about it. So the first thing we do is let's create a survey, okay? So this is in July, 2019, this is happening. To give you some idea of how long ago it was. And we knocked together a survey and we send it out. We make it quick to complete, some very simple questions, lots of multiple choice stuff. And we get 31 responses back. Now we've got kind of a tech pool of people of around about 500 at this point. And uh, not all of them are using Kubernetes, so kind of a 5 to 10% return. We think 30-odd responses is okay. So that's great. So um, I'll go through the actual numbers and the results later, the nitty-gritty of it, when we look at year-on-year -year comparison. But we ask about um, which tribe people are in and which squad. It is anonymous because we want people to be honest, uh, but we do like to know which area they work in. We ask about uh, which features they're using in the clusters, um, uh, and their thoughts on those particular features. And then we also give them some free form responses. And the results are pretty good. I'll, like I said, I'll go into the numbers in a bit. But even looking at like the free form responses, we get lots and lots of positive stuff. So we put together a workshop. We go through it with the team to discuss um, uh, the, the, the feedback we've got. And we, we, we work out and categorize the responses into hit, miss, and maybe. And there's like the majority of 17 out of the um, sort of 30 odd responses we got really positive. Seven of them are a bit in the middle. And although we got seven responses which weren't so positive, they were still really constructive. And that was great because we then got something to work towards on that. Um, to give you an idea, we were already pleased about that because this is a team game and it's not just about the customer experience team, it's about the whole squad because it's all their work we're judging now. And these are some examples of some of the feedback we've gotten. You can see it's, it's, it's really great. Um, although we were asked for, as I say, some constructive stuff on maybe our documentation and our onboarding process. And at this point, I'm thinking, well, things are pretty good. Is this actually broken? Do we actually need to do the customer experience thing? And when I look at how we were working as a team and how we were working with our customers, it was clear we still needed to do this stuff. So we, so we carried on. Okay, so now the work has to start. 
what do we do? Well, we had a few options to start with to kick this thing off after the survey. The first one we could do is rebrand ourselves. We could call ourselves customer success engineers or um, some other funky job title. But we decide as we're going to be engineering and building stuff and the fact we're still going to be working with the other teams inside the squad, we will stick with our current job title of platform engineer because that's what we do. So we stick with that. And the temptation was to then dive into the uh, little backlog we put together and choose the thing which needed the most um, care and the most involvement. And again, we, we kind of did that, but there was something nagging in my mind before we did that. Um, being a big proponent of the kind of DevOps methodology and approach, the three ways, the five ideals were kind of nagging at me that we, we really should be clear on why we are doing this as a team, understand that. So that's what we did next. And we put together this mission statement and as you can see, it says our mission is to engage, empower, and support our customers. That's what we're trying to do. Which for some of you watching, you might think that sounds a little bit like middle management bingo buzzwords. Um, and a little bit kind of like uh, waffly high level stuff that doesn't really mean anything. So we sat down with the team and we put this together and we really thought about these words because getting that mission statement was right. And actually, Engaging with people is what we do. Empowering people is what we want to do. And supporting them is something we're going to do as well. So actually, these are the right words for what we're going to do. So we decided to stick with these. But we've got ourselves now a mission, a true north, something that we can aim towards. And whenever we're trying to make decisions about what we're going to do, we can pin it back to all of these um, objectives, which were listed here, and uh, decide whether it's the right thing to do. So super important we put this in place. Okay, so the next thing we do is work out who. Who is using our stuff? We've got some ideas and some opinions about who uses our stuff, the people we speak to on a regular basis, but we want to find out who the actual engineers and the developers uh, that were actually uh, maybe not talking to us directly, uh, but were actually using our stuff. So we have an integration in our Slack system for a chat op kind of thing, which will create support tickets for us. So uh, that will take the, um, the, the details of the conversation and store it into the, uh, into the JIRA ticket, for the support ticket. And what we worked out was if we analyzed those support tickets, there was, a, there was a lot of value in there. We hadn't done this. So we put together an FAQ was the first thing. We took three months worth of tickets. We categorized them and put them into pigeonholes of similar kind of questions. And then wrote some answers for it. So we've got an FAQ and that in itself gives us um, a uh support document which is hopefully going to reduce the the regular questions we get asked so that's great but we've also got all this information of who's asked those questions so we realized if we printed off some of the org charts we've got that are in various document repositories for the tribe around the business as a very primitive form of customer relationship management system a crm we could actually see in the organization where the requests were coming from and that was really useful. So we could see the different areas of the business which were actually interacting with our stuff. It also meant when we got onto doing things like training and support, we could later chart that onto the, the um, diagrams and we could see if there was a mismatch or an overlap or where we maybe needed to put more effort into training into different areas. So we really, although it's fairly basic, it was really powerful to see that um, discrepancy or overlap to work out what we needed to do. So at this point, we've got a good idea who we need to talk to. We know the engineers that interact with us through our support tickets. We know the people we speak to anyway. And we've got a rough idea in terms of, you know, just the organization, who are the right people to talk to. So the next thing to do is to do that thing where you can get out and talk to them. So we created a series of regular meetings. One meeting per tribe per month. Okay, so we'll have, you know, we've got five tribes to talk to. We'll have five meetings in the first month, five meetings in the second, et cetera. But I think as techies, we aren't necessarily great at putting meetings together. Yeah, the Agile ceremonies were great. At, you know, we all have really strong opinions on how to do a retro and how our planning should be done. But in terms of like uh, meetings, I think there's very few I've been in which have had like a chair or a scribe or any real form of structure. So we decided we were going to book that trend. We were going to structure our meetings. So the format we decided on was 
we would go through actions from the previous meeting. We would do updates from IPE. So these are updates about the clusters and the features and from the engine and the capabilities team. We would then collect feedback from our customers on features or problems or whatever it was they wanted to talk about or what other stuff they had upcoming or it's big projects or whatever. And we would collect that so we could take that back to the other teams in the squad and make them aware of upcoming stuff and plan accordingly. We also made the conscious effort to document this stuff and make it available to anybody that wanted to look at it. So we did all our meetings in the open. We were accountable for our uh, meetings that we ran. We also had an open door policy so anybody could come, whether they worked in that tribe, whether they worked in any of the other teams in the squad, they were invited to come along. And by doing that, we created uh, visibility for everybody to see what we were doing and also a way for the boss to keep track of me as well. So next thing, roadmap, what are we gonna do? We've got some stuff to do. Well, you remember that from our survey, our survey said uh -uh, our onboarding is rubbish. So we've helped put some tooling around the onboarding, create some Jenkins jobs, which would create code for the onboarding process. Our onboarding process involved two pull requests into two Terraform repos. If you don't use Terraform, that's kind of scary. So we put some front end in front of that to do that for you. We also realized at this point that keeping track of all the stuff and who owned the stuff in the cluster was becoming a problem. So we started off with some spreadsheets, as you do, and we tracked ownership of the Kubernetes namespaces. And namespaces are kind of like logical areas within a Kubernetes cluster where workloads run. So they're kind of like the where teams put their stuff. So we tried to keep track of that in spreadsheets. That didn't really work because things would move around, information would get out of date, particularly when we were trying to collect capacity estimates and stuff, it was like a moving target. So what we realized was that if we actually stored that information on the cluster as metadata, attached either as an annotation or a label, a bit like AWS tagging, if you use that, onto these actual namespace objects, we had a source of truth. We could also get the customers to update it. They could uh, update, add that information when they create a new namespaces. So by doing this, we were centralizing this metadata and we didn't realize it at the time but by doing that, that enabled a load of stuff we were going to do down the line. The first thing it helped with was logging. We've got um, uh, a single uh, elk index in our elk stack that's run by one of our support teams. And if a namespace or a workload on the cluster got busy, it could do the noisy neighbor thing and drown out all the other messages and cause a huge backlog. So what we did was we sharded the logging onto a per tribe basis so that um, if one tribe had a noisy workload, it wouldn't affect logging for the other tribes, or it would only affect locally to other squads using stuff inside that, net, inside that tribe. And we used the metadata which we'd stored to identify where those logs were gonna be shipped. We used that configuration data we'd stored in the cluster that ownership information to actually ship the logs to the right place. This also really helped us when we started looking at capacity planning. We got estimates in the cluster, we could start using those to plan uh, workloads coming up and we encourage teams to update those and that's so much more easier than managing a spreadsheet which needs updating uh, every other week and it unlocked a lot of other stuff we were going to do down the line which i'll cover in a bit the other thing we have is we were already doing training so these is a hands-on workshop we'd already run this for about a year it was written by uh, one of our principal engineers who was working in the engine team uh, back in 2018. So we were doing a basic Kubernetes course where you would spend a day building an application on your laptop. Um, to date, I don't have the numbers for 2019, but to date, as of last week, so far we've had 244 people go on that training course. Um, last year we put a survey in place, so not way back to the beginning, but we're getting a satisfaction score of like 91% are very satisfied. So a real you know, um, positive um, feedback on that. And as a result, we put together an advanced course, which allows people, again, a day-long workshop to come along and run an application on our cluster, which we give them, and they add logging, monitoring, storage, load balancers to that application. And by the time they leave that course, they've got the necessary skills to build out an application on our clusters and use all the connected services. Again, we've only had this running for a year, so this was completed in April 2020. Uh, to date, we're hitting about 10 people a month on that. Um, obviously, situations of doing things remotely aren't great. We'd like to be able to scale that up, but we're finding that difficult over uh, 
over Zoom and such tools. But again, very high satisfaction rate on that course. Okay, so our first year of doing stuff, we've done the baseline, we've worked out our true north, we've put together an FAQ, we've worked out who we need to be speaking to, we started the meetings, we're starting taking that feedback and we're passing that on to the other teams in our squad uh, and working with them. And also we are building features and tickets for those teams as well. Um, but we've established all this ownership information, sort of the logging out. How's that gone down with the customers? So we survey again. Now, bear in mind, this is July 2020, and the world's a bit different, as we all know, at this point. So we send out a survey, and we're very wary that, quite rightly so, our organisation is very concerned about the people who work in it, and are also sending out surveys for well-being uh, and for you know, work-life balance, and trying to judge that through surveys. So there is a bit of survey fatigue, um, so we try not to be too pushy on getting our survey out there and getting a response. But we get 25 responses back, which is, you know, six short from the previous year. But again, not too disappointing. So our survey has the same format as the previous year, apart from we've added two extra questions in, which we are going to use for baseline. We've got some opinions about stuff that's not so good. So we put the questions in the survey to see if our customers think that. And then if they agree, we can do something about that in our roadmap next year. So let's see what happens. Okay, so again, it's anonymous, but we ask teams which squad or tribe they're in. Uh, we get around 20 to 25 different squads replying. So that's great. We've got a nice spread across the business. We ask them which of our clusters they use. Not surprisingly, our test cluster is the one they, uh, they, they say they use the most. Um, I had to gray out kind of like names and stuff for like, you know, sensitive information. So sorry, I can't share the, uh, the full details with you, but they probably wouldn't mean anything anyway, unless you worked inside Skybet. Uh, which cluster features do you use? Um, our service mesh was a surprise high ranking thing on there. Everything else was kind of as we expected. And then we get into the interesting stuff. We get into the nitty gritty of people's opinions. So we have this bunch of questions which you can answer strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. And we present these questions. Uh, nine of them are from last year, the top nine, and the two at the bottom are the control questions we've asked from, to see if we're, our opinions are validated about what's going on. And the thing here for me is the, the overall thing is there is more grey and blue, so agree and strongly agree, which means it's a positive result, rather than the orange that's there. So we're seeing really positive results. There's one or two surprises on there. Um, we didn't uh, realise our, our documentation was perceived as bad as it is but it is, and the two questions at the bottom to do with um, workload resource and to do with whether people know and attend the meetings is actually quite low, um, but that's what we thought anyway. Um, if we look at that as a year on year thing, and we look at it based on the previous years, so from the original survey we did in 2019, I can analyze and I can split these numbers any way I like. I can massage the stats. You know, I can say, well, there's six less responses, so therefore I can adjust the numbers. For me, the thing that's important is we have more blue and gray this year and less orange than we did the year before. That's the key kind of like number I'm looking at. And yes, it, it does indicate that some of the some uh, changes in uh, opinions have gone the, gone backwards. So as we say, our documentation, um, and also there seems to be a slight gain in the popularity of our legacy systems, but that's fine because those teams have done a load of work to improve those as well. So our kind of takeaway at this point is things are getting better, okay? Again, the free form responses are gushing and, and lovely and really polite uh, in a way I don't think I've seen on the survey before. So I'm really pleased about that, particularly that top one. That's, that's a really good one for me. <laughs> given what I do. And again, we share these results with the whole of the squad because this isn't just our doing that's done this. It's about the platform which the whole squad runs. So, you know, we share that with them. We celebrate this as well. Okay, so on to this year. Well, this year we're coming to kind of the halfway mark on. So um, what did we choose to do? And we changed our focus a little bit. We had a discussion and we decided to change what we were doing a little bit. So rather than focusing on how can we help our customers, we focused on more how can we all help our cluster. 
So by creating a healthy platform for people and a well-managed and well-maintained one, that's helping our customers and it's helping us to run it as well. So this is this is a, a little bit of a shift, a subtle one, but um, a very important one. I'm going to run through all of these uh, bit by bit in a minute. But um, just to kick off with the training, we have written a new course. Um, we're still running the two other ones. As I say, these are the, the up-to-date numbers, so there's no change from the previous one, the previous slide. Uh, but our new course is aimed at a different audience. So we've only given it to eight people because we've only done like the control test session with it. We haven't actually got it out in front of the public. Um, and there's a lot of work gone into it. It's a three-hour seminar. There's at least 150 slides. It feels like 300 when I'm presenting it. Um, but it's aimed at, not at engineers. It's aimed at people that don't want to spend the day of their life getting their elbows dirty with YAML. It's aimed at architects, service lifecycle managers, Agile delivery leads, product owners, engineering managers, technology leaders, you know, people who understand the technology but don't necessarily just want to know how and what it is and how it works. So that's what that course is aimed at. And uh, we'll be running that in anger over the, uh, over the next year. The other thing we've done is we, and this has taken a while to put together, but really pleased we've done it, is we wanted to put together some standards and some best practice. And I understand that the phrase best practice is very contextual. Um, but uh, we put together roughly about 60 rules, if you like, or standards, all categorized uh, under Moscow. So must, should, could, we don't have any will ones, but must, should, could uh, to indicate their um, importance. Uh, I can't share them with you, but to give you some idea, I've got one here, which is a don't run with uh, the latest tag on an image. So if you're running a container image, Usually you don't bother specifying the actual specific number. You just put latest because you're running it locally. When you're running that in production, you want the specific version. And if you're running with latest, that could present a problem because if somebody updates that container image and tags it as latest, then potentially you, when that workload restarts in your cluster, you could be running with a different version of code than you were previously. Maybe it's got you know new features, deprecated features, might behave differently. You know, and unless you're managing that through your service lifecycle, that could be a bad thing. So we put together these, these these rules to to help us do this, and they're based around build, deploy, and run. So three different categories, and we work specifically with the people we engage with in our meetings. Got their input into these, got their feedback. We've let them review it. We made sure they checked it and uh, responded to their comments. So it's really been a big, like company wide effort to put this together. What we've also done is we've realized we can codify some of these. So there's 17 out of the 60 we have converted into uh, something called open policy agent uh, rules. Now, um, we don't enforce those, these, but we could do. So we could, these codified rules, we could actually stop workloads be deploying onto the clusters. We don't do that, but we have them in a kind of reporting mode. And we use a tool called Gatekeeper to take those metrics and then some in house stuff to pull the state of those. Um, uh, standards and compliance into Prometheus, and then we can dashboard it. So now we've got a dashboard where we can see the state of the workloads on the cluster against these 17 rules, or by tribe, or by squad, um, and we can fold and analyze these numbers on there, which is really, really powerful. We've not had this before. And of course, our InfoSec team absolutely adore this approach as well. Um, what we've also done, um, based on the ownership information, we're able to combine that with um, usage stats and being able to produce not only capacity plans, but, but uh, cross-charging um, statements as well. We're able to give our teams a bill for what they're using on some of the clusters. Uh, we've also included a utilization figure in here so we can talk about optimizations that they can be done. And all of this stuff and all of the compliance stuff I was just previously speaking about are powered by those labels. That's enabled us to do this so that our um, reporting is up to date and current and relevant to the people that need to see it. Then what we've done is we've changed the agenda of our meeting slightly. So yes, we still talk about actions from the previous meeting. We still talk about updates from the team and any uh, new features or anything teams need to know about. And we still collect feedback about upcoming workloads or problems or whatever it is and produce actions off the back of that document a minute in the public. But we've also started talking about those numbers. We start talking about that compliance dashboard. We even bring it up in the meetings and filter out for the team that the squad and tribe are talking to. 
a look at the numbers. Uh, the same with the cost information. And what that's allowed us to do is have really good conversations about how their workloads are behaving and how they've been built. And they may go away and change the way their stuff runs. We may have to go away and think about whether the rule's right or if we need to downgrade it from a must to a could, for example, or whether they need to, they've got a valid case for having an exception put in place because of their particular circumstances. So we're having these conversations uh, about their stuff. And that's kind of the important thing that the, the meeting is now talking about uh, the, the stuff running on the cluster and rather just about needs of months. So having conversations about data over opinion, which is kind of moving towards SLI, and then we could go SLO and SLA if we wanted to. But just to be clear on this, we, we are gardening, we are not policing. So when we are talking to teams about these numbers, we are not blaming them. We are not uh, telling them off. We are not hitting them with a stick. Uh, and we've also been incredibly careful about who has access to these numbers so that nobody else does that on our behalf, if you like. Um, but so far, it's encouraging a lot of really good conversations, and that's you know, that's great. The thing that hasn't gone so well is trying to get more people that haven't been to the meetings before to attend. Um, but also, our interactions a, a little bit further afield uh, into the tribe. So we've run a lot of like adult workshops on specific topics, like you know, in this case, uh, how to manage resources. We've done uh, wider promotions, like in all of the training courses, we promote the meeting at the end. Uh, but we have been involved in some bits of kind of consultancy where we've been asked to review designs and look at the approach teams are taking, which has been really great. We haven't quite got to the point yet where we're going into teams and working with them and helping them with their solutions. That's really where we'd like to get to. Final thing is we sorted our documentation out. Uh, the team have worked really hard on this. We've got rid of all the stuff we don't need we've categorized it by customer versus maintainer we've made it product focused we've really simplified it so hopefully when we send the survey out and teams uh, respond about the quality of our documentation it goes in a positive direction because it really should there's been a heck of a lot of work on that so we haven't done the survey yet because it's not july but we will be doing and i think really our our perceived progress on this as a team is everything's going really well apart from our outreach could be better. Uh, and we're really, really chuffed with uh, the fact we're having these discussions about standards and about uh, capacity and, uh, and usage. Um, we're not sure where they're gonna go. That's the next thing for us to work out what we do about those formally. Um, now we move those into like a, uh, a productized part of our, our offering. Just as a little side note, um, it turns out we might be visionaries. Um, this was in the ThoughtWorks radar for May 2020, but talking about um, not only applying product management to internal platforms, but establishing empathy with internal customers. This is like a thing. Um, it's not in the November one. Um, I think they've merged it in with uh, platform teams, uh, product platform teams. I think it's got merged in with that. Um, but if you're thinking about doing this stuff, for context as uh, to why you might be doing it and why you might want to understand your organization get all, get all of this it, it's it really is great read this because it um it won't tell you how to do the things we've done but it contextualizes why you should be doing things okay the other thing i would recommend the other book looking for my library uh, is accelerate by nicole forsden Jim kim and uh, jess humble there's a whole chunk on here about running surveys and how to do them so that your questions aren't loaded or leading. Uh, and I actually wish I'd kind of read this before I'd done them because I'm not sure our questionnaire is as uh, pure as it could be. But so rec I recommend you read those. Right, let's wrap up. Um, this is our to-do list we're planning at the minute. We're still kind of kicking ideas around about what we're going to do after we get the survey back in July, which will... Uh, inform a lot of our ideas anyway but certainly more gardening we've still work to do with what we're going to do with the standards and capacity costs and of course we've got this new training course to launch and run uh, we want to work with one of the tribes that is producing an abstracted standardized way of running workloads on on our kubernetes cluster they've got some opinionated ways of doing stuff so it's kind of turnkey with sample code and uh, standard base images and all sorts of other clever stuff 
we really want to work with those and they're moving to an internal open source model. So that's a great opportunity for us to get involved with that. Um, we want more workload dashboards than we've got. And uh, something like Backstage is kind of very appealing, but it looks like a lot of work and is still relatively a uh, new product, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, we'd still need to improve our outreach. Things aren't perfect. I'll be, you know, I'm not going to say things are brilliant. Uh, we still have problems. Our service mesh, for example, has been in a pretty rough uh, ride over the last few months. Uh, fortunately, we've sorted all that out before the big horse racing events recently, but we still some uh, work to do on that. Um, and we're still working with the teams. We are still part of the squad. We are still working uh, and working on features and tickets for the engine and the capabilities team, as well as our own stuff. And we need to do that so that we are um, aware of the features on the cluster and understand it for when we're on support. And also when we're talking to our customers that we are informed about stuff that's happening because we're actually using it as well. We're, we're living that as well as talking about it. Some anti-patterns. Um, I've not seen one team do all of these, but I've seen bits and pieces done. So the first one is let's try the CX thing. Um, this is when a team is treating it like a tick box exercise and they'll just do something and then forget about it. I obviously spend all day, every day thinking and doing this stuff. I have a very strong opinion that this is something you work at. It's a job that you do. It's not something that you um, can do like once a week or once a month or something. The idea of sending around a ad hoc survey and not getting many, many responses uh, just so, again, you've tick box exercised it. I'm not very keen on that. I think that's uh, that's not really doing it. That's just trying to tick the box. The one at the top to do is screen recordings. Um, I've seen teams make screen recordings and they're very good. They put a lot of work. They take a lot of work to do. Uh, but there's two problems for me with screen recordings. Um, number one, they go out of date very quickly so that you have to keep revising them. And that's a lot of work to do. Um, they get lost as well inside the document tree. But even more important than that, we have found when we have run training with our customers, they love it because they are getting, you know, they're getting a freebie essentially. Uh, who wouldn't want free training in Kubernetes as a, as a developer, you know, if for nothing else for your CV, uh, you know, to have experience and exposure to it, to decide whether or you want to use it or whether you want to use it at SPG. Um, our training courses are so popular, they get booked up almost as soon as we, we, we release them. So I see there's a very good engagement piece for involving your customers and getting to understand exactly what they're letting themselves in for and how they're going to use it. Again, I'm very biased in this. Um, I realize we're not all extroverts. Some of us are introverts. Some of us don't like going to meetings. Some of us would rather avoid talking to people at all. That's fine. If that's the case, though, like be honest about that. Don't just kind of like, try and create an alternative that's not going to work like just create a slack channel you know find somebody else to do that engagement because i think unless you are talking to people and engaging with them you're kind of missing the point of this that's where the value is um, and then the other thing i've seen and this is this is kind of in reference to our dashboards and compliance dashboard and our costing numbers very carefully who sees them i've seen people un unmittingly um create a report send it to all the um, lead people that deal with that particular technology, CC in somebody senior with, with a view to them just having visibility of it, that, but unfortunately the senior person seeing it as an opportunity to encourage people to fix things. That can severely, severely break a blameless culture and cause a lot of trust problems. So um, don't do that. That would be my advice. So, Let's just recap what we've been through tonight and what you can do. Okay, so we baselined, first of all, we understood where we were with our relationships with our customers and the bits they were using, okay? We then established a mission statement, a true north. Yes, it included some words which um, were a little bit maybe um, fluffy, but actually when we buried into it, they actually were exactly what we uh, meant and exactly what we'd done. And having that true north and that mission statement has been really important for the team to understand why and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And, you know, hopefully the outcome from that. We put together an FAQ, which of course should cut down your support with queries anyway, but in doing so, we found out all the kind of like end users of our stuff rather than the people we were talking to who were fronting it. From that, we could start talking to all of them. In meetings, which we ran regularly, 
we had a standard structure for and gave them the opportunity to talk and feedback and we could take that information from those feedback loops back to the team so that we could do something about it if we needed to. Um, establishing owner ownership and getting that metadata has opened up so many things from us from logging, standards, compliance, all sorts of things and probably a load of stuff we don't even know we're gonna do yet. Um, we've done training, we found training a real enabler, that might not be your thing. But when you've established that and you've run it for a while, we ran it for a year, we measured it again. After that, standards. Went into the second year of stuff. We put together compliance reporting off these standards so that we can have meaningful conversations with people, but we got everybody to input and buy into those. So it wasn't just something we went away in isolation and did and went, ta-da, here's the new rule book. No, we included people in that and made sure they're involved in that. Capacity planning making sure people have got visibility of the numbers and they can understand them. And we can have these data-driven conversations in the meeting about stuff that's important. Prove your documentation, do some advanced training if, you've, uh, if uh, you if you need to do that. Um, push to talk to as many people as you can and then measure it again. Final point, that one's the important one. Having that true north, having that mission statement and direction is so important because it focuses everybody on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Thank you for listening. Hope you found that useful and uh, we'll have a go at taking some questions. Amazing, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot to unpack from that, definitely. And I think, um, you know, thinking about these things, it, like you say, it's not, it's not just a tech problem. People matter so much to whatever you're building. And I think seeing that come across in this talk has been, um, particularly enlightening for myself. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, Dave has his hand up already, so we'll jump straight over to, to Dave White. We've got a few in the chat as well. Um, we've got a few minutes for this, so hopefully we'll get for a few. Um, so Dave, over to yourself. Andy, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I think we have established before that ought to be quite similar to what yourselves do at Sky Betting uh, and I definitely plus one on the platform workshops that works a treat for us. Uh, definitely taking our customers through how they use the platform, how they get better at monitoring. It uh, really, really works and beats a totally agree with a recorded uh, video or some out of date documentation. That's always great. I could ask a million questions, but I'm trying to struggle to find in my head to get one that I'd more curious about. And I think I've got a curious one is uh, on ownership. So you got platform team that are building platform and you've got customers that have got quite a lot of control building out apps, including load balancer, et cetera, et cetera. Who's actually responsible for if their app breaks or if their app uh, A breaks, responsibility, they would they get alerts for that and be totally all over that? Secondly, how, how do you, I'm guessing they can have X amount of um, replicas uh, add CPU as much memory as you want, etc. How do you control them not actually going down a dark hole and causing platform issues at some point? Okay, so two questions there. So the first one in our advanced training, we get them to sell monitoring. We use Prometheus Operator, which allows teams to easily define service monitors and uh, Prometheus rules through like really small chunks of YAML. So. Um, Although we have a centralized Prometheus on our cluster, we are encouraging teams to run their own. Um, so yeah, uh, that will route through to alert manager and whatever alert manager config they put in. So they are monitoring their own workloads and responsible for responding to that alerting. So you build it, you run it, you get up in the middle of the night when it cries. Okay. Um, obviously there's some overlap there if it turns out to be uh, a problem related to the underlying cluster, in which case we will get called out by those teams. That's a challenge I think we're at facing now is we have got a very much an operational team that even handles application alerts. It's few and far between, but we are trying to look at how do we pass the devs, but it's the, if devs get an alert or a product squad gets an alert, but actually it's a underlying database issue or underlying platform issue. Well, actually the platform team doesn't get those a lot of those anyway. Is there any point in us actually handing those across to the devs? And that's a bit of a quandary we're sort of dealing with at the minute. Because it's not like um, I'm talking about some of our squads. It's it's one or two alerts a year out of hours that they occur. So it's like the balance of is that the right thing to do? 
Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, our experience, we're, we're on call the cluster anyway, so we've got our own monitoring. So hopefully if there is an underlying cluster problem, we get alerted before it starts affecting customer workloads. Right. So we can proactively fix that. But in terms of the actual application things, the best people to fix that, are the people that built it, in our opinion. And, you know, if they want our help, if they want to um, escalate it and bring us into that conversation, that's fine. Um, I don't want to tempt fate, but I think from what I've seen in Sky Betting and Gaming, I think our team get the least number of call-outs I've seen compared to many other teams. Um, it might be just because that sort of stu- that sort of stuff is super reliable or, you know, the, the, the bulk of the problems rely with applications. Okay. The second, Forgot sorry, more. the second question you had was um, around um, uh, teams going uh, wild with stuff. So we've put retrospectively, we've now got um, cost and information. Uh, we don't put it. We could put in something called resource quotas. So again, I'm not I'm sure not everybody's a Kubernetes um, engineer on the call, but we could put in stuff like uh, resource quotas to to actually block that. For some things, we have put that. There are limits in for like you can't create more than a certain. You can't create certain workloads for a start, so you can't create like daemon sets or any kind of like cluster wide ones. Um, I think we we have a great deal of trust with our users. I think is is, is the honest thing through the training. Um, yeah, we see things where teams do, you know, things which are should we say suboptimal, but equally we've now got our standards compliance in there, and anything that flashes up from if it's in those seventeen rules. Um, we can talk about that, and that might not be like causing a like a runtime problem. That might just be like a problem that hasn't happened yet, yeah. because they are running things in a certain configuration which we previously seen as bad or risky. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, we obviously the resource isn't infinite, yeah. um, but at the minute with our capacity planning we've done in the past, we've so far managed to head off any problems with that. We have had problems. Um, Recently, we, we got to the point where one of the clusters, uh, although it had spare resource, it didn't have enough spare resource in single node. And we've had to do some stuff about that. But fortunately, because we did Kubernetes the hard way, we can expand our underlying clusters. So the AWS cluster will auto expand anyway. We use the yep. cluster auto scaler on that. So that in theory will go to a, a limit on the um, SG, so they won't go beyond that. And if it gets that high, we have got a problem. That's like yep. three or four times like, the usual Saturday uh, usage. So there's something gone awry at that point. Um, but um, yeah, on-prem we can expand the cluster and we have done, um, although um, we've done a recent hardware refresh so we've got a lot more resource available, but we haven't used all of it yet. And again, that's down to capacity planning and, and I think talking to the teams uh, in our meetings and understanding what big workloads have you got coming up? What load testing are you doing? Those kind of things. So, so far, it seems to work quite well. Cool. It'd be good at some point to do a, a more of a deeper dive for all the share. I think there's, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned, either company. Yeah, sure. Of course. Cool. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate that. Great stuff. Thanks, Dave. Um, we've got a few questions coming in. I've tried to capture the ones in the chat, and then when hands have gone up, so I'll try and keep things in order for you, Andy. Um, next one, any tips for providing safety or emotional awareness so that discussions on SLOs, SLIs, et cetera, came across as gardening and not policing? Oh, um, one thing we have done is we have spoken with our management about these numbers and said, you know, and provided as much context as possible because with all the numbers, the, there's context and there's um, meaning behind them. So I think educating the people that could potentially you know, uh, cause a fuss about them. We made sure we spoken to, to those people and kind of like warned them about stuff and said, there are these numbers, but, you know, context is everything. Um, other than talking to the people in the teams, um, we, I think we've, we've, we've kept the exposure to those numbers to um, people who understand the implication for, for, for their peers. So for example, if we've got one tribe that's a heavy user and got you know something that's actually quite significant that, that could be fixed, um, the people in another tribe kind of understand the situation they're in. And they're, you know, nobody's out to like get anyone or you know dob anybody in or anything like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, real good stuff. But again, that's cultural stuff. So, of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, next question: In organizations with more than a hundred devs, uh, IT, true DevOps is more about process, people, and culture, not technology. Andy, how do you find is the best way to start that journey in legacy organizations? Crikey. Um, so I don't know I'm the best person to answer that question. Um, so we, uh, Sky Betting Gaming, our DevOps journey started on the 11th of August, 2011. There's an actual meeting which our head of infrastructure pulled out when, uh, when, when that discussion first happens. And obviously back in 2011, we were a lot smaller. So we've evolved the business with it, retrospectively fitting that. Um, there's a book here. You might want to have a read at that is all I can say. Um, and choose your consultants wisely. Um, yeah, I mean, start with the small stuff, build it up, educate, share, demonstrate value in stuff, rinse and repeat until people get that. Um, again, I've not done that, so I can't really definitely uh, offer you a concrete way of doing that. The best of luck with it, really, honestly. No worries. Thanks, Andy. Uh, we have Martin with his hand up. Um, I think that means you're willing to speak. So can we, can we unmute, please, James? Hi, hey, thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, great talk. Uh, so a question I wanted to ask was, when you said that you're using the surveys to drive a lot of the work that you're doing, are there any other metrics or measures that you were using to define which work you should be doing or anything to do with like financials around the platform and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so certainly the, the, the focus on finance um, has been a thing which has changed a bit this year. So for a little bit of background, we, are, we, we recently um, went through another merger. So we are now part of the, uh, with the UK and Ireland division uh, alongside uh, Paddy Power and Betfair uh, as part of the Flutter Group. So uh, that happened last year. So there are, um, you know, discussions about all sorts of things going on. But, but certainly one of those was, um, you know, looking at, at, at you know, uh, high costs. Um, so one of those has been some of the hosting bill we've been looking at. So they have uh, encouraged a conversation uh, about the capacity stuff of perhaps a little bit more than maybe we would have done organically. So certainly that. Plus we have from our technology leadership, OKRs, uh, which they, they, they filter down and obviously they hit the management team for the infrastructure tribe and turn into other deliverables. So yeah, it's not just the stuff that we um, spot and we think we should do. There are, you know, um, uh, steers from, from the wider business as you'd expect, but we do have a lot of uh, autonomy in the sense that we can pretty much dictate what goes on our roadmap. Obviously we have to deliver on certain things which our management and our, our superiors want, but you know, we have a lot of autonomy on how we do that. Okay, thank you. Great stuff, thank you, Martin. Um, another couple of questions. Uh, next one, do companies smaller than Skybet need platforms like this? Um, I think it's a modern way of building applications. I think containerizing your workloads and making them portable. Um, I think there's a, there's a question there about complexity of Kubernetes. Um, and I think, um, it, obviously it depends. If you know you don't have to build your application to run in a containerized um, Kubernetes environment, you don't have to. But if you're looking to scale or you're expecting, uh, you know, spiky, spiky workloads or something like that, that might be something you want to consider doing. Um, just to pick up on on the next question about complexity, um, I think in terms of our engineers' adoption of it, I mean, obviously we started back in 2016. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying our platform at that point was, you know, there's the API endpoint, here's kubectl, off you go. So, uh, in the early days of the cluster, there wasn't really the, um, the, the developer tooling there other than, you know, people rolling their own stuff, which is what people did. Um, what we've seen happen, though, is we have seen one team, and I think I alluded to it in the talk, uh, are, are building an abstraction layer for their engineers so that they don't mm -hmm. have to know necessarily all the, uh, nuances of the Kubernetes workloads uh, and they will be on call for um, that kind of like uh, abstraction layer um, for uh, for their customers within that tribe. 
So it, it, can, it can be layered. Um, again, we, we, we find actually with our engineers that they want to learn the raw cube. You know, with, with yeah. some teams, we have taken on, you know, um, rancher instances and, you know, craft artisan um, container environments which have been built and migrated them all to our Kubernetes platform. So there's certainly a desire within the organization for people to, you know, want to do this stuff and, uh, and, and learn all about it. Yeah, it's an interesting point that I think, you know, as teams take on some of that responsibility it can almost be a seed for future platform development as well. You know, you do, you do still need some element of trying new things out as well, really. Yeah, good point. I think that kind of captured the next question. There is a final question, um, an extension to Dave's question on ownership. At our company, we ask delivery teams to own their running services, but also their databases. We make DevOps engineers available to teams that need them and they help with DB cluster build. However, this can lead to certain responsible responsibilities falling through the gaps. Um, what are others' experiences? So um, I'll, I'll open this up to you first, Andy, but I guess if anyone else wants to chip in, just raise your hand. Um, it feels a bit more of an open question. Sure. Um, I think there was certainly a, a lot of talk um, probably two years ago about not running databases on container platforms and the um, uh, problems that that might arise. Um, we started work on an internal MySQL implementation, which we offer as, a, as an operator. So to create a multi-container or multi-instance um, um, MySQL database, which is all replicated, um, you can do that with about 10 lines of YAML in our environment and that is all provisioned and managed for you by the operator um, if there are any problems with that um, first of all the the dba team are already re alerted to the uh, instances run by the operator so in theory any problem should actually be fixed before you even know about it as an application team running it um, but they have to domain the knowledge of working with mysql um, and also have uh, some of the operational uh, knowledge enough to be able to work out what the problems are, but they can escalate that to our capabilities team who also help manage that service. So we offer that as a managed service for our developers. So uh, with databases, that's the way we, we've done that, but we abstract from the teams away a lot of the intricacies of running the data, but the database so it's run by the DBA team effectively. Yeah. And um, I think that's, that's been our approach. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Dave, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just to uh, ours is very much we're migrating from traditional Oracle, traditional MySQL on prem to Cloud SQL to uh, Mongo Cloud, uh, Postgres, stuff like that, but all cloud. And yeah, our centralized DBEs, they manage that a minute, but we're trying to give very much access so developers can via code to not worry about uh, my speech DB, but very much take it more on their control and also allows you to help build in stuff like uh, maintenance. If there is cloud maintenance, we've got scripts that will know that it is proactively tell our monitoring system to ignore any alerts for an app during this 60 second window when maintenance, maintenance is going on and stuff like that. So that's, that's really working for us. We're at a tail end migrating now, but we want to ditch Oracle completely and that seems to work. But yeah, answer our side, it's more centralized, local. We handle that, but make it easy for developers not to worry about any of that. It's all in hand. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Um, there are more questions coming through. Have you got another, I'm well, conscious of time for one. Um, I'll probably do the wash up in a moment, but maybe, maybe one more. Um, where do your customers view the service on the commodity to value add scale? And would you like that to change? Ooh, that's not something I measured. Let me write that down though. I like that one. Um, I think um, I think with our connected services, I, I think they do value it. So um, for example, uh, we make it super easy for them through our capabilities team to create DNS entries. They throw a bit of YAML. No, they, they don't throw a bit of YAML, they release some YAML through the correct pipelines and change management process um, on, onto the cluster. And that will create DNS records. The, the load balances are automated. 
uh, by uh, tools running on the cluster. So on-prem, you will get uh, an F5 configured. On uh, our uh, Amazon instances, you get an ELB configured. Our logging works out of the box. Um, uh, storage is automated as well. So uh, your PVCs will be created a PV, and that will be on-prem storage on the NetApp arrays, or it will be an ELB. EBS on our AWS clusters. Um, I would like to think they value that because it's just so easy. Um, I mean, we have an open discussion with teams about what capabilities they want to see on the cluster. We, so we have things like, can you provide us Redis? Can you provide us Mongo? Can you provide us Kafka? And for yeah. some of those, we've been away and written um, uh actual uh, operators like the MySQL one to do that. But other stuff, we will take a community operator, like say, for example, the Redis one, and we will offer that as a service under the understanding that problems with that actual thing itself, um, they'll have to go back to the original developers of that and uh, the people that manage that because we didn't write it. Yeah. So I'm hoping that um, for those services and the way you know the services people want, we can automate those and we can provide those as much as we can. And if I suppose it's, um, uh, if they don't value that, then um, we must be doing something wrong. I hope they do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've still got some questions coming through. Are you, are you okay for time, Andy? Are you happy yeah, answering sure. questions? Um, I'm not so what I'll you, do... but... Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, what I'll do just so, um, just so people who do need to get off, I'll just do a quick wash up just, um, close down the meeting and then we'll, we'll carry on answering questions uh, for as long as people are happy staying around. Let's not put a, um, any pressure on anyone to hang around beyond a certain point. It was only scheduled until half past. If you bear with me a, a very quick second. Um, so for uh, just the purposes of finishing the meetup really, um, just want to firstly thank, thank Andy and Kuvi for, for talking today. Um, I also want to make a call out for more speakers. Um, everyone's welcome. We like people coming talking with us for the first time. Uh, we like seasoned people coming along and we like a different mix of, of talks as well. So whether it's business, culture, uh, tech talks, uh, all, all are welcome under the DevOps banner. Um, and we're also really keen on feedback too. Um, so, you know, if you've enjoyed uh, this evening, uh, shouting about it on Twitter, responding on, on Meetup or Getting in touch directly with us would be, would be massively appreciated as well. Uh, we'd usually have a survey uh, that we'd link you to, um, but I think that one's fallen through the gaps this time. So maybe we'll follow up on Meetup with a link to a, a survey um, after reading the putting surveys together part of Accelerate so we're not loading our feedback in a positive manner. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's a pretty much closed down for the meetup. So if you need to drop off now, feel free. If you want to hang around for questions, uh, you're more than welcome. We'll be, we'll be around for a little while. Cool. Okay. So where did we get to? A uh, bit of a fun one, I guess. Are there any services you found did not play very well with Kubernetes? Um, ones that want a lot of memory. Uh, one that wants a lot of CPU that's bigger than a node. Uh, that can be a challenge. Um, there's, uh, I don't want to name products because it feels like I'm picking on them, but there's, there's certainly a graph database um, that uh, just requires a lot, of, a lot of resource, which we can't supply on one node. So anything that needs to scale vertically, I suppose, is, is, is anything that's kind of like a no-no that's just really too big. Um, the, the, also, the problem with... Um, workloads that are slow starting remember kind of like kubernetes sweet spot is where we've got these really elastic workloads and we're you know we're, we're scanning stuff up and scanning stuff down with the horizontal put auto scaler or the cluster auto scaler that's the sweet spot but anything that's kind of like big and slow to start is generally not ideal um the only other one i can think of out of the bat is um a streaming message queue service that begins with a K. Again, I don't want to say what it is. Um, again, just because of the amount of resource it needs to run, um, we're trying to stay away from or you know, steer people away from that. Plus, we have got other teams that will run that as a service in the yeah. business. So we don't really need to run that for them because it's already pretty much turnkey anyway for people. 
Yeah, definitely. It's finding that kind of right resource profile, right tools for the job, all that, isn't it? There's no silver bullet necessarily. Uh, next question then. What tools do you use to manage DNS via YAML? Uh, I feel like I should say as well, Andy, if you need to drop off at any point too, don't feel under pressure that you have to stay here and answer all the questions. I'm okay. I'm fine at the minute. Plenty coming through. Right. Um, so yeah, what tools do you use to manage DNS via YAML? Okay, we, uh, we have inbuilt uh, operators that work with custom resource definitions that talk to our DNS providers, and we've written that in-house ourselves. Perfect, nice and quick. I'm just scrolling down. I think that might be it, actually. Um, excellent. Well, that looks like the end of the questions. Um, if, if anyone wants to ask anything else, uh, you know, you can still raise your hand. Um, but I think, I think we're pretty much done. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot for your time, Andy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's uh, always one of my favourite meetups, Manchester. I do like talking here. Shame, shame I can't be uh, on the other end of the Trans Pennine Express. But, yeah, uh, maybe next time we get. Maybe to be next time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again for everyone attending. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we'll speak to you soon. Have a great rest of your evening, and um, yeah, bye for now.